Okay, so we are going to continue with this second lecture of this morning. Uh, it's going to be delivered by Professor Laden Franco from the University of Nova Gorica. Hello? Yeah. yeah, now it seems to be working. <clears throat> so, hello to everybody, and uh, welcome to this second session of, of this still morning. Uh, I will be talking today about a technique that uh, you were introduced to earlier uh, last week by my colleagues uh, Marcano and uh, Professor, where is Umberto to help me, from Mexico, <laughs> um, about thermal lens spectrometry. Uh, this is a technique which is basically complementary to what you have just heard about the fluorescence spectroscopy. Yeah? So in thermal lens spectrometry, in principle, we don't like fluorescence. I will, and I'm sure you know already, because we are, we are losing the absorbed energy through fluorescence. We don't like the emission. <coughs> we like the conversion of the absorbed energy into heat. And this is where the thermal comes from. And uh, by changing the optical properties of our samples, which means the refractive index, we create something which is similar to an, a real optical lens, and we use it for highly sensitive detection in chemical analysis. So um, the introduc introduction by my colleagues who work in this field was, I, I'm sure, very, very from the physicist's point of view. Um, I'm an analytical chemist, and I will not be so rigorous on some mathematical expressions that we will use. Uh, in analytical chemistry, we like to use uh, approximations, simplifications, and if we get a straight uh, or linear relation between the concentration of, and our signal, we are, we are quite happy. So, um, but I will, I will point, point out some uh, theoretical uh, points today which are important for understanding more or less the coupling of thermal lens spectrometry to other analytical techniques. And uh, to understand this, I have listed here some requirements for analytical methods in what I call here biochemical analysis. Bio comes from the title of this Winter College, which is uh, something related to bioimaging, yes? Uh, so this is not really analysis in biochemistry, but this analy um, chemical analysis re related to biosystems. We will see tomorrow applications for the analysis of, um, uh, let's say, uh, fluids in single cells, different biological fluids, different toxic elements which are relevant for um, um, which are related to uh, health, also to food quality if you want. Uh, there is a long list of potential applications in what we call here biochemical analysis. So um, first, uh, of course, with advanced, uh, advancement in science, with uh, let's say new frontiers we, which are set in front of us, we are very frequently facing the problem of sensitivity. So to make new discoveries, usually we need to deal with the, with the limitations in sensitivity of the instrumental technique, techniques which are available to us. 
Then secondly, very important, in, uh, particularly in the respect to biochemical analysis, is the selectivity. We must be sure that what we are detecting is not just something in our sample, but it is really the compound that we are targeting. And uh, finally, I would like to focus to um, new approaches in, in chemical uh, analysis, which have a lot to do also with the cost efficiency, but mainly they are related to sample throughput. And uh, in this regard, I would like to define two terms which are in the past 10 years or even more used in the, in the chemical analysis. And this is so-called rear guard and what we would like better is the vanguard analytical methods. And it has to do with the labor-intensive analytical methods, which are usually also costly. These are commercially available. And due to the fact that they need a very laborious sample preparation, they are also time-consuming. Uh, of course, the advantage of such methods is that they fulfill all the, at least the first two criteria, and that they are usually certified. So if you want to have a certified analysis, you would usually decide for what we call a rear guard analytical method. But why rear guard? Because in the big demand for quick answers and analysis of large number of samples, you know, even sometimes large number of compounds in those samples. Usually, when my colleagues come to me and bring a sample, they say, well, if you have done it yesterday, it would be even better. Yeah? And if it would cost nothing, even better. So these are the problems that we are facing in uh, everyday analysis, be it environmental analysis, where I work a lot, uh, food quality and safety, uh, medical diagnostics. Can you imagine how many samples are analyzed every day in uh, different uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare institutions? So, uh, not to mention industrial processes. Yeah? There, it is very important to have information on time to be able to control the production process in the chemical factory, for example. And for that, you don't need the most, uh, the most precise information, so to say. Sometimes we can settle for a semi-quantitative analysis, as we call it, or even what we use in a, frequently in vanguard methods, so-called yes or no response. Yes or no response would mean, for example, then in a, in a sample of uh, fruit, you are looking for a pesticide. Are pesticides present or not? To give you a uh, practical information from Slovenia, where I come from, on the average, with the very strict, con I mean, with the, with the national uh, uh, surveys, which are regulated and require analysis of certain number of samples, we find out that about 10% of samples are problematic. But we are analyzing 100% of samples. So 90% of samples are an analyzed just because they have to be analyzed. And we are losing time. We are losing money. We are producing, on the other side, a lot of waste solvents. We are trying to preserve our environment, but we are analyzing water, uh, water samples and finding nothing in those, so they are okay, but we are polluting environment because we create waste solvents. So this is some kind of uh, contradiction in this sense. So if we have reliable vanguard methods, we can detect accurately those 10% of problematic samples. And only on those, we apply what we call then a rear guard. Then we go looking back what is actually in that sample and how much it is. Yeah? So uh, tomorrow I will show you some more concepts, but 
just like, like you to understand these concepts because they are very much important for understanding of the development in what I will talk about in thermal lens spectrometry, which is basically dedicated to this sam high sample throughput analytical methods, which I will be des describing later on. So, just quickly review some basic processes which are important in spectrometry, so to say transmission mode spectrometry, and from here on we will go on to the thermal lens spectrometry. So, uh, in the transmission mode spectrometry, such as spectrophotometry, for example, or infrared spectrometry, usually we have a sample and we measure the intensity of incident light here, which we call I0, and the intensity of the transmitted light. Yeah? And this is governed by the very famous Bear Lambert's law, at least famous to analytical chemists, which says that the absorbance of the sample equals the negative log of transmittance, which is the ratio between the outgoing and income ingoing uh, light intensity. Uh, here you can notice immediately that uh, while physicists prefer to work with the natural logs in analytical chemistry, we work with the decadic uh, logarithmic system, and therefore frequently you will see this 2.303 factor in the equations which derive, and we have it here already immediately, uh, which derive from the transformation of the natural log, uh, of the decadic to natural log, basically. Uh, for low absorbances, we can develop uh, the exponential function. So, I equals I zero to the e to the minus what we would call absorbance. Yeah, this one can can be developed into Taylor series, and for small values of a, we can then take just the uh, linear term of this series. And under such conditions, we can say that uh, absorbance, which in chemical analysis is defined as a molar extinction coefficient times the uh, optical interaction length times the concentration, equals the relative change in the intensities of the incident and outgoing light. This is one of the approximations that we will make in our further discussions. And, uh, of course, uh, absorbance, uh, this relative change, which is given here, is multiplied by the conversion of logarithms uh, factor 2.303. So, it uh, should be on this side, that's why it's divided here. So, uh, please remember this relation, because later on we will try to compare the sensitivity of thermal lens spectrometry through to absorption transmission mode absorption measurements. Uh, now, how can we improve the sensitivity in this kind of measurement? We cannot do it simply by increasing the intensity of light, because the ratio is always determined by the Bear Lambert's law. So we cannot use, in the transmission mode, we cannot use these very powerful tools such as lasers. Yeah? In increasing the light intensity, which would be given by a laser, doesn't help in this respect. So what do we do? We look for the lost photons. You see, here there is much less photons than on the incoming side. And this was ex explained by our previous speaker of, uh, about the fluorescence. So if we are looking about the uh, emitted phot photons after the relaxation process, those Photons, the intensity of this radiation is directly proportional to the, to the incident radiation. And this is what makes fluorescence such a highly sensitive analytical technique. Similarly, if there is no r radiative emission, the absorbed energy is converted to heat. And this changes the temperature of our sample. And of course, the change in the temperature 
is proportional to the incident radiation. More power we put in, higher the temperature in principle. This is what you will start feeling now when the spring comes out, you know, you will like to sit on the sun and in the summer when you will enter your car, you will touch your steering wheel, your fingers will be burning if, if the, the car is left on the sun. This is exactly the same process. It's the conversion of the absorbed energy into heat. And this is what we are exploring in phototermal techniques, particularly in thermal lens spectrometry. So, change in temperature, of course, means change in the physical properties of materials. And in thermal lens spectrometry, we will exploit the change in the refractive index. But we will not work with, with very high temperature changes. Usually 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 Kelvin is sufficient. So don't worry that your samples will be boiling. But still, the power densities which we will use are high enough or very high to cause photodegradation of our analytes. And this is what we will discuss in more detail later on. What we want to generate is a temperature gradient. And this one usually has the temp uh, maximum temperature on the axis of the excitation beam. Because of this, the Gaussian profiles of laser beams are preferred. But we also know now about theories have been developed and the practical experiments have shown that also the so-called head top uh, beam profile can be, can be used. Uh, in most liquids, the re resulting refractive index gradient is uh, diverging, has a diverging effect because the change in the refractive index with temperature is negative in liquids. In some solids, the change is positive, and I will show some measurements also um, further on. Uh, as a result of this thermal lens, the laser beam is defocused, and uh, we observe the change in the beam radius which is associated with the change in the intensity at the beam axis, which we are actually measuring behind a um, filter that filters out the pump beam and behind a pinhole, which limits our observation of the beam intensity to the, to the axis of the probe beam, actually. And I'm sure that you have heard uh, a lot about this by Professor Marcano. So I will not get into detail. Uh, have you had the thermal lens experiment in the laboratory already? But you were probably not showing such dramatic effects as I, I have here on my slide. You see here the thermal lens. Here is an is a image of the beam spot projected onto the laboratory wall. And when we, uh, this is the probe beam, and when we excite with the green laser, we have, of course, a compound that is absorbing the green light. We immediately see the change in the radius of the, of the probe beam. Yeah. Now, if we insert the filter, which will filter out the green light, then we get such, such effect. Yeah. Basically, this is a very, very strong thermal lens effect, and uh, we call it uh, a saturated thermal lens with the maximum change in the probe beam intensity, and uh, it, uh, to impress some visitors, you know, you can make such nice experiments, which are, of course, useless in, in chemical analysis, because with such a strong effect, you cannot get any meaningful result about the concentration of your analyte. Uh, I will talk today only about what you have learned as a mode mismatched thermal lens configuration, yeah? I think Marcano uh, has spoken about uh, mode matched thermal lens configuration. Mode mismatch means that we will focus our pump beam into the center of the sample and the temperature gradient will be created as shown by this, uh, let's say, changing red color 
uh, of course, with the maximum temperature developed on the, in the center of the sample, where we then shine our probe beam. As you can see, the probe beam is focused slightly in front of the sample in this case. This is what we call mode mismatching. And the Gaussian profile, in such case, of the probe beam, here is the detector plane on the very far right side. This profile will change with the changing radius of the probe beam. And this change in the intensity on the beam on its axis is what we take as a measure of our signal um, to be strict we should speak about the relative change but and this is what students sometimes forget they just take, take the signal from the locking amplifier which is even not uh, exactly the same value as you should get from an oscilloscope and they forget that if they insert another filter, the I0 will drop and the relative change will remain the same while the locking will show you a lower signal. And then they come, oh, we have lost sensitivity. What do we do? Also, if you, if you put your detector further, the intensity will decrease because the radius increases. Same story. You should always take care of measuring the initial beam intensity so that you can relate it to the relative change in a, um, in a beam intensity, which is proportional to the, to the concentration. Uh, we can do a lot of nice images about uh, the, the beam profile. This is the initial probe beam profile, and this is the probe beam profile after the excitation. We see the decrease of intensity on its, on its axis. And we can even find different theoretical descriptions which describe the time dependence or the evolution of the thermal lens signal with time during a single excitation. Um, as I said, in chemical analysis, we prefer simple relations and we like to simplify of course, we must have good arguments to do that, but in most cases, this theta factor, which you find here in this expression, and it stands for absorbance times the power of the excitation beam times the temperature coefficient of refractive index of our sample divided by thermal conductivity and the wavelength of the probe beam. This comes from the diffraction. The other two terms come from the thermal effects. So in, in most cases, the absorbance is so low, we are measuring absorbances of, on the order of 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. So for usual concentrations that we measure, this theta term becomes much, much less than 1. And therefore, we can, of course, neglect all the uh, second order terms in this equation. I w in the continuation, I will also speak frequently about the so-called steady-state thermal lens. Steady-state thermal lens would, be, would mean a, a thermal lens at the very, very long excitation times. And uh, long ex excitation times, you see that the, the second term here would limit to zero because this is... Uh, it, it, this part will limit to zero, and uh, this will become a constant. So we will have a constant signal with time. And also, what I should mention here for this expression, this expression is derived for the optimal position of the sample with respect to the focus of the probe beam. If we go back here, you see, we have placed the sample at a certain position with respect to the foc focus of the probe beam. And there is always an optimal position for this in the mode mismatched case. And usually this is, now depends which theory you take, but this is either, uh, one theory says, one confocal distance from the waist of the probe beam. The other one says one confocal distance times square root of three. In principle, we always determine this experimentally in the laboratory. So 
we don't bother so much with the theory, but of course it's nice if you can show that your measurements are following some uh, theoretical prediction. And uh, I will show you some cases later on, not for standard or macroscopic thermal lens spectrometry, as we call it, but for what we call thermal lens microscopy. So, uh, to, in view of, of chemical analysis and application of thermal lens spectrometry, we should outline some advantages which made this technique quite popular in chemical analysis. And this is, of course, high sensitivity that I have already outlined. Stems from the fact that the signal is proportional to the excitation laser power. So in principle, by exciting, uh, increasing the excitation power, we can increase the sensitivity. As we have seen, it also depends on the thermal properties of our sample. So the higher the change of refractive index with temperature, the higher will be the signal, lower the thermal conductivity, higher will be the signal. And we will see how this reflects in the so-called enhancement factor. It has been reported that absorbances as low as 10 to the minus 7 can be measured, and this was demonstrated in many applications. The response of the thermal lens is relatively fast. It's on the millisecond, sometimes even microsecond time scale, uh, t with time constant, yeah, and this range, which is very important for online measurements in chemical analysis, because we will see that we cannot perform, in most cases, just a simple batch mode measurement in a standard spectrometric cuvette. Um, and, of course, because we can focus laser beams very tightly, we can measure sub-picoliter volumes, we can probe sub-picoliter volumes, and we can perform detection in so-called microfluidic systems. Microfluidics is a big expanding field of, uh, also in chemistry, and of course it also requires highly sensitive chemical analysis and detection instruments. But while many people are usually trying to impress the uh, audience by advantages of their techniques, uh, I would like to be, let's say, honest to you and outline some drawbacks of thermal lens spectrometry or photothermal spectrometry. Um, sometimes we still need improvements in sensitivity, as I said. Um, to do this, we can change the solvents. Uh, we can also increase the laser power. But this is not good for photolabile compounds because we will destroy our sample. If you imagine that we are using laser powers of some 10 to 100 milliwatts, and we focus this almost to the diffraction limit sometimes, especially in thermal lens microscopy. So the, the spot radius of, of um, the pump beam is on the order of one micron or less. And this causes extremely high power densities, which can destroy uh, samples or analytes if they are not phot photostable. Uh, still, we are facing the problem of laser sources. Yeah? I'm talking about cost-effective analysis. So we cannot afford, for a routine analysis, we cannot afford a, um, very um, sophisticated, for example, titanium sapphire laser, which has a, a tunability over a reasonably wide range. Usually we work with the simple solid-state lasers with just one wavelength available. Of course, we can have several solid state lasers, uh, but the problem arises when we need to go low with the excitation wavelengths, when we need to do chemical analysis in the UV range. There, the, the availability of lasers is very, very limited. So we have to, we have, we have to perform some coloring reactions, and this, such reactions usually take time. These are derivatizations of different type, and they require time. And for this, we try to reduce the time 
of uh, um, this coloring reactions, sometimes also sacrificing the sensitivity of the technique. Because, for example, if we need half an hour to complete some reaction, maybe it's sufficient to do it in five minutes. With this, of course, we lose the concentration, but we can compensate it with the, with the laser power or sensitivity of our technique. The main disadvantage that I would like to stress here is the selectivity of thermal lens spectrometry. And this, again, stems from the fact that in most cases we do measurement at a single wavelength. There were some reports, but I remember only, only one by Professor Omeneto from ISPRA. He did some spectral studies of lanthanide ions in aqueous solution by thermal lens spectrometry. But that, again, required um, sophisticated dye laser pumped with the excimer laser and, uh, of course, also quite, it was time consuming. And certainly, we cannot do um, wavelength scanning with thermal lens spectrometry when we couple thermal lens detection to different analytical separation techniques, as we call it. And those are usually used to increase or enhance the selectivity of the analytical methods. We, we know high-performance liquid chromatography, ion chromatography, capillary electrophoresis. These are all techniques that require detection online with the flow of the element which is eluting our analytes from chromatographic column. About the photodegradation and speaking about the flowing systems, flowing systems usually help in reducing the photodegradation because the residence time in the detection cell is much, much shorter and this decreases the photodegradation. And I will show you some, some examples later on. Now, first, let's see what thermal lens spectrometry combined with liquid chromatography can do in terms of sensitivity and, of course, in terms of selectivity. Here, as you, as you see in the title, this is analysis of a blood plasma sample for determination of carotenoids. Carotenoids are known antioxidants, and of course we would like to have more antioxidants in our blood. That's uh, our, let's say, desire in a certain way. Uh, what are carotenoids? Carotenoids are long organic molecules which have a system of conjugated double bonds, and those double bonds are basically uh, quenching radicals and oxidative species. You have probably heard about beta-carotene, lycopene in tomatoes, carotene in carrots, of course, and there, are, there is a whole series of different um, analogs of carotenoids which we want to detect. Of course, they are colored, so they absorb in visible. The maximum of absorption is around 480 for you, most of the carotenoids. For lycopene is closer to 500 nanometers. But what you see here is actually a thermal lens spectrometer. The blue is the excitation beam coming from an old argon laser. Uh, so uh, 488 line. And we combine it with the probe beam coming from this small helium neon laser with a dichroic mirror here. And here you see a flow through cell which is connected to chromatographic column. And here is a chromatographic pump. Basically, with the chromatographic column, we separate different components of our sample. And they come to the detector, which in this case is thermal lens spectrometer, at different times after the injection. So if, if this is the time scale, injection of the sample here. So here we would see some different peaks which correspond to different carotenoids. This one here, I can tell you based on the analysis of standards, this is a beta carotene. This one in front is alpha carotene. And these are different, different uh, 
isomers of lycopene here on this, uh, at the longer retention times. If we compare this sensitivity to the conventional diode array detection, which you usually buy with the liquid chromatograph today, this is what, what you get. You hardly see the most intensive peaks in this chromatogram, so the analysis is much less sensitive. Uh, this was the first demonstration, one of the first applications that we have done in combination with the liquid chromatography. And uh, since then, we are mainly focusing on turbulence detection in, a, in the flowing systems. Uh, here I would like to point, because in the next step we will look at some theory, but I would like to point at the to the sample requirement and the volume requirements for thermal lens spectrometry. What we use here in this case is a, what they call a sample, a, a flow-through cell, which basically has two tubings. One is in, one is out. So our solvent is flowing into this sample cell, which is one centimeter optical interaction length, and the total volume of this cell is eight microliters. So nothing special. It's very easy to focus our laser beam. The, the diameter of the aperture here is uh, on the order of one, one millimeter. You can calculate based on the volume and the length. Uh, so, and also the injection volumes which we use in liquid chromatography, here you see the injector. Injection volumes are on the order of 10, 20 microliters. In ion chromatography, this goes up to 100 microliters, so here we don't have very, very restrictive requirements about sample volume and the detection volume. Uh, it will be a different situation in a, in a capillary electrophoresis, for example where we have a capillary here, and we have to perform detection at a certain point of this capillary. So we will be, we will be using a probe beam, and we will focus our pump beam in this direction. And so here we have a collinear propagation of the pump and probe beam, and here we will speak about the transversal propagation of the pump and probe beam. I didn't see this on, on the slides of, of, of Marcano, so we, we can spend a few minutes on this. Uh, so here we will speak about the detection volumes of much, much less than one microliter. Yeah? Of course, the concentration sensitivity in this case will be much higher. Here we will be able to detect only higher concentrations, but the total mass in the detection volume will be substantially decreased. And in the thermal lens spectrometry uh, microscopy, the Japanese group of Kitamori has reported less than one molecule per detection volume sensitivity. We will dis discuss, this is of course disputable, how can you detect less than one molecule? But uh, we will see later on, maybe tomorrow how this can be done. It's an average signal over certain time which shows you less than one molecule. Now, speaking about flowing samples, I'm sure that you, you have seen this equation in the derivation of thermal lens theory last week, but for I, I think you have not seen this velocity term here. And this is very important because our samples are flowing flowing through the sample cell or flowing through the capillary. And flowing means that the flow is taking your heat away. So you are losing the heat that you were generating through the radiation less the excitation of your analytes. So this is something not desired, something that we would like to be able to correct for. But immediately I have to tell you that in, in such collinear cases where the uh, flow rates are on the order, usually on the order of 
half a milliliter per minute up to one milliliter per minute, the loss of the heat because of this flow is insignificant, so to say. It's on the order perhaps of a few, few percent only, while here in this case you see that the interaction length is very, very short, so with the similar or even smaller flow rates, the heat is displaced very far from the excitation point in a very short time. So in this thermal, uh, thermal diffusion equation, we must take into account the, the velocity term. Here is the uh, source term, which also depends on the type of excitation which we are using. And here, on this slide, you immediately see that the source term is quite different for the pulsed excitation, in case we use pulsed lasers, or for the modulated, and this describes the modulation frequency with the continuous wave laser, and uh, that's why we use here the average power, or power, better say, power density, because A squared is the radius of the pump beam. So, okay, let's, let's go back now to the very, very quickly to the expression of thermal lens signal. We have seen that uh, the uh, thermal lens signal is defined as the relative change in the probe beam intensity, which can be related to the uh, relative change in the squares of the probe beam radius before the excitation. This is time zero, and at a certain time t, during the excitation cycle. And using sim, uh, a simple ray transformation matrix, you can very easily come to this expression which relates the square of the probe beam radius at time t to the initial value and to the focal distance of the thermal lens. This FT is actually the focal distance of the thermal lens which we are creating in our sample. Of course, at time zero, there is no focal lens or the focal distance of this lens is infinite. Yeah? At a certain time T, then the thermal lens appears and it gets stronger with the excitation. But, uh, the ray transformation matrix gives us also the dependence on the distances. Z1 is the distance between the focal point of the probe beam to our sample, and the Z2 is the distance between the sample and the detector. Usually we work in the far field configuration, so the, uh, both distances, Z1 and Z2, are much, much bigger than the cofocal distance of the probe beam which also appears here in this equation. And uh, also the focal distance of the thermal lens is usually bigger than the cofocal distance. Here are the, also the, here is the initial condition as I have described. And by using these approximations, we come to a very simple solution for the thermal lens signal, which basically says that the thermal lens signal is proportional to the inverse of the focal distance of the thermal lens. And with this, we can develop then different expressions for different configurations and for different excitation modes. Now, if we have a collinear propagation of the two beams, the inverse of the focal distance would be proportional to the temperature coefficient of refractive index, optical interaction length, and the temperature gradient with respect to the radius of the excitation beam. In the case of transversal, of course, we have to integrate over the entire, over the entire pump beam, 
because the entire pump be, will be actually creating the temperature gradient, and the temperature gradient is perpendicular. We are looking to the temperature gradient perpendicular to the direction of our observation. So this is uh, in this direction here. This is the direction y. Perpendicular to this is direction x, while usually we take a z as a propagation of the probing in, this, uh, in such systems. So here you see, because of this integration, the, this is not dependent on the optical interaction length, because it's only over the profile of the excitation beam. Uh, with these expressions, we can then derive the signals for the collinear configuration, pulsed mode. Here you see that uh, very soon after the laser pulse, the signal is the strongest, and then with time, the signal slowly dissipates because the heat is released into the environment or to the bulk of the sample. Yeah? In the case of continuous wave, you see that the, uh, the signal is the largest at longest times of excitation. Uh, what is interesting here is that the signal in the continuous wave goes with the inverse of the square of the pump beam radius. Here we must recall the expression for the time constant, which also depends on the square of the pump beam radius. Therefore, we have the fourth power here. Uh, this is even more important when we speak about the transversal configuration. And uh, here you see we, we, we talk about the absorbances. In chemical analytical terms, this is the absorption coefficient, basically multiplied by the optical interaction length. Absorption coefficient, again, as I have described it earlier, molar absorptivity multiplied by concentration. And here in this case, uh, where we need to probe a very small sample volume, we can see, and this requires small beam ready, yeah? small beam radius of the pump, as well as probe beam, but particularly with respect to the, to the pump, we see that uh, given the fact that time constant is proportional to the square of the pump beam radius, we have to the third power, and this is just inversely proportional. Yeah? So it's much, much more desired to use pulsed excitation because we gain a lot in terms of sensitivity because of this, this dependence. Smaller the excitation beam, more we gain in terms of sensitivity. So these are the simple, simple consequences of the modes of ex excitation and the configuration of the pump and probe beams in, in thermal lens spectrometry. Okay, and just a graphical presentation of the signals. Now, here you, you must be, you must read it properly. Yeah? This is the signal. It's not the change in the probe beam intensity. This one would be just the opposite, yeah? with the opposite sign. The probe beam intensity will drop, and then it will relax back to the initial value, while the signal in the pulse case is the highest immediately after the pulse, and then it decays with the given time constant. In the case of continuous wave, it builds up slowly until it reaches the steady state here. If we break the excitation, because we use a, usually we use a mechanical chopper for this, then the signal will start to decrease to the initial value of the probe beam intensity. Uh, here I would like to mention just an, another 
approach, which is a combination between pulsed and the continuous wave excitation, and we, we call it uh, quasi-continuous excitation. For example, you have a pulse laser with a very, very high repetition rate, and you would then apply a mechanical chopper on, on this uh, output of such a laser. So, you know, if this is the time profile of the excitation, uh, this will, will show the open and closed period of the mechanical chopper. So here you would have a lot, a lot, a lot of single pulses, which overall will act as a quasi-continuous excitation. So the, the signal development is basically similar to, to the continuous wave excitation. But you can do it also, also with, the, uh, with the pulse lasers, but with the very, very high repetition rate. Now, why we prefer continuous wave excitation? There are two reasons. Pulse-to-pulse -pulse reproducibility with pulse lasers is not the very best. So we get a much better stability of the excitation beam in the, continu uh, in the continuous wave excitation. And secondly, we can use locking amplification, which facilitates very much the, um, the convolution of our signal and the data treatment later on. So most of the applications in chemical analysis are in continuous wave mode excitation. Now, uh, another look at the so-called ultra sensitivity of thermal lens spectrometry compared to the transmission mode measurements. Now, regardless uh, the fact which model we use, either parabolic or aberrant model of thermal lens generation and the effect on the probeam, uh, we can immediately see that this relative change in the beam intensity, which we have for low absorbances, we have approximated with the 2.303 times absorbance. Yeah, this is in a transmission mode for low absorbances. For the thermal lens, here we see a different relation which includes this, what we call the enhancement factor. And the enhancement factor comes mainly from the thermal properties of the medium in which we perform the measurements. So dn over dt, temperature coefficient of refractive index, and thermal conductivity. So if we calculate this enhancement factor for a one milliwatt of excitation power, we come up with the following numbers for different solvents. Of course, water is the most widely used solvent in nature, not only in chemistry, in nature. Um, and especially when we have to do with the biochemical analysis, we are very, very much forced to do the measurements in water. But unfortunately, as you can see, the enhancement factor is, of water is relatively low. So if we want to have a comparable sensitivity to the transmission mode spect spectrophotometry, we need at least 10 milliwatts of excitation power. This is what this number tells us. But when we have 100 milliwatt excitation, we already win by a fa one order of magnitude, a factor of 12, according to this. Uh, it also depends a little bit on the probe beam wavelength. But we can see that for organic solvents, which have much higher temperature coefficient of refractive index and much lower thermal conductivity, already with a, with a single milliwatt of excitation, we get almost five times higher sensitivity compared to the spectrophotometry. Acetone is somewhere in between. Uh, but unfortunately, such nasty, nasty solvents such as benzene, carbon tetrachloride, and so on, they have the best optothermal properties. But 
we have to avoid them. Uh, now, another way of expressing the enhancement factor or the suitability of a solvent is just to take the ratio of the temperature coefficient of refractive index and the thermal conductivity because all the rest is laser power and laser and probe beam laser wavelength, which you usually keep constant for a given uh, instrumental setup. But here you can see that we can, we can avoid some bad solvents. For example, working with supercritical fluids, it's a very, very interesting, and it gives extremely high, extremely high enhancement factors. The problem is that we are on the very steep part of the curve uh, in terms of the change of uh, thermal conductivity or dn of dt with respect to temperature or pressure. So we have to have very, very stable conditions to keep this enhancement factor stable. Otherwise, uh, the signal is, is quite noisy. Uh, but other uh, sol uh, solvents are also interesting. Very popular lately, ionic liquids. So we have studied several different ionic liquids like um, methyl, imidazo methyl imidazolium salts with different anions, triflate, uh, borofluoride, and so on, and different lengths of the alkyl chains attached to this imid imidazolium ring. So we, here you can see that with, with some ionic liquids we can reach enhancements comparable to the best organic solvents which are less, less, much less friendly to us than uh, ionic liquids or at least from the environmental point of view they create much less problems. So the selection of the solvent is very important from the point of view of sensitivity of our measurements. Of course, we can do mixing of organic solvent, solvents which are mixable with water. We can use additions of acetone, ethanol, acetonitrile. But when we are going to the biological systems, again, we have to take care of denaturation and, and uh, such processes. Uh, to illustrate the dependence of the thermal lens signal on uh, thermal properties, um, I would like to show an interesting uh, piece of work that we have done uh, quite long ago. But it, it was the question of determining the maximum of the refractive index of water. And uh, about, yeah, let's say 25 years ago, you could still find a very, very broad range of temperatures from, I think, plus two to negative values. And some, if you look to lorentz lorentz equation, some were absolutely wrong from the, already from the theoretical point of view. Uh, but still, they were published. So we have done a, a very nice zero, zero point measurement by changing the temperature of water, performing the thermal lens measurement. Here, this lighter part of, of this plot demonstrates the opening cycle of, of the thermal lens experiment. And we can see that when we go from the room temperature down, we are actually decreasing the dn over dt. Because if we have a refractive index as a function of temperature, this one follows more or less function of, of density. Yeah? You know that the water has a maximum at 4 degrees Celsius, the density of water, and the refractive index has a very much similar behavior. So at the maximum of the refractive index, n over dt equals 0. dn over t enters all of the equations that I have shown. So if we have a maximum, the n over dt is zero, we have no signal. And this is what we see here. So at a certain temperature, which was more or less close to zero degrees Celsius, we observed no signal. And then we, when we went to super cooled water, 
And this was no ice, it was water. Uh, when you go into the region below the maximum, the n over dt changes from the negative to positive. So the sign of your thermal lens signal changes. And this is what you, what you see here. Instead of photothermal defocusing, you get photothermal focusing of your beam. Because the n over dt changes from negative to, to positive. And with this measurement, we, have, we were able to determine with quite high accuracy and precision the temperature of the maximum in refractive index, which is close to zero degrees Celsius. So about four degrees shifted from the maximum of the, of the density. Um, another thing that we, you must not forget is the contribution of the changing concentration. So that in addition to the dn over dt term in all the equations that we have shown so far, we should include the dn over dc term. And this is important in, in systems where you can observe such phenomena like a Soret effect, where you have, because of the slight heating, you get the diffusion of your uh, molecules into the irradiated area and the concentration, concentrations are relatively high and they can change, they can change the, the refractive index but they appear at a much, much slower time scale. Yeah? Diffusion is a long process. Thermal relaxation is a much faster process. OK, now we have refreshed a little bit our theory and uh, explained for some particular cases the effects of flows. We have not spoken yet about the effect of photodegradation. And uh, here I would like to show you an example uh, which is also important for, from the chemical analysis point of view, uh, the termination of hexavalent chromium. This is a very toxic carcinogen. Uh, that's why we are interested in determining very low concentrations in natural waters, different water samples, and so on. However, if you use a very, very high laser power, what you get is this line A here. B is the line uh, with basically caused by the absorption of the, of the blank. Uh, there is no photodegradable part in it. But if we consider the theoretical description of the evolution of the thermal lens. Now, uh, yeah, here we have some problem. This is what we are showing here is basically the negative thermal lens signal, yeah? Because here, uh, this would correspond to the probe beam intensity, basically, yeah? But doesn't really, uh, really matter. It's not so important, but uh, what I want to show is that the signal doesn't evolve to the steady state condition after a certain point. It starts decreasing and then it reaches some equilibrium value. And the reason for this is that uh, this complex which we form to detect chromium, uh, it's a complex with diphenyl carbazone, basically, um, it's a very specific colorimetric reaction. Only chromium, as a, chromium 6 or chromate as a very potent oxidant can oxidize, oxidize the reagent and form the complex which absorbs at around 500, 540 nanometers. But this complex, or I should say all the complexes with diphenyl carbazone, metal complexes with diphenyl carbazone are known as a photolabile. So some would degrade already at the, at the sunlight in the laboratory. Some, like chromium, is more stable. But still, when using high laser powers, the, the complex de degrades. And this is reflected that already in, in this way that already during a single excitation cycle, we observe the degradation of this complex. 
And we can even describe this with the equation. Here we have the constant of degradation rate. We have the diffusion constant and the, the, the two concentrations. One is the initial concentration. One is the equilibrium concentration here. Uh, so far, we have always considered the concentration during a thermal lens experiment constant. Yeah? We didn't speak about it. It was always taken as a constant part of the uh, thermal lens signal. Now, this is not constant anymore, but we can still describe. And this line here in the curve A follows basically this equation. And you see that at a certain point, when diffusion of the non-degraded chromium complex into the irradiated area equals the degradation rate. At that time, we obtain a much, much smaller, but a constant thermal lens signal. However, we have to wait much, much longer than, than here. So this, this is an example of a photodegradation, uh, which we have also confirmed by additional measurements in, in a batch mode system that show, so if we, if we have a, a standard one by one centimeter cuvette, and we measure, we, we put, let's say, two to three milliliters of such solution in such cuvette, and we monitor the signal with time, over, over half a minute approximately, you can see that we already lose more than 20% of the compound. If we connect this into a flowing system, so if we take this as a reservoir of our solvent and we connect it to such a flowing system, and then we put it back, you see that in, in such a system, then the residence time of our compound in the irradiation area will be much, much shorter. So you see that the degradation is much, much less expressed. So this tells us immediately about the advantages of the flowing systems in, in, for such photolabile analytes. And uh, still with what we call the flow injection Flow injection system means injection of our sample into a flowing medium, which brings the analyte into the detection cell. The exposure to the high power density is short. We can obtain a very, very favorable limits of detection, which is on the order of <coughs> less, than, uh, less than 100 picograms per milliliter of, of chromium-6. This is way below the regulatory limits, but also way below standard techniques. If, if I go back now to the rear guard techniques, rear guard technique for the chromium metals would be usually atomic absorption spectrometry. If you do electrothermal atomization, you could reach limits of detection of the order of probably one nanogram per mil. Um, even higher if you, if you do uh, ICP emission, optical emission spectrometry. Okay. Here we are still out the, uh, with uh, relatively large sample volumes. Now, for such system, which was developed for the purpose of capillary electrophoresis by, by Faubel and his group quite some time ago, we have said that we are using pulse laser excitation, yeah, because the dependence on the pump beam radius is with one over third power, which gives us high sensitivity, but because of the low reproduce pulse-to-pulse -pulse reproducibility, we prefer to work with the continuous lasers. So for, for such purpose, the so-called thermal lens microscopy was introduced for detection of, of small volumes, yeah, with usually continuous lasers or 
quasi continuous pulsed mode. Now, what is the secret of thermal lens microscopy? Basically, the principles are all the same as we described already. The only difference is that uh, both the pump and the probe beam are focused with one and a single lens. In the case of conventional or macroscopic thermal lens spectrometry, we are focusing the pump and the probe beam with the different lenses to obtain the mode mismatch. Yeah? So to get the mode, mode mismatch, of course, you cannot use an achromatic lens because you will focus the pump and the probe into the same spot, which doesn't work. So you must find a specially designed lens, or usually you take a very, very old microscope. Those had standard lenses, no achromatic lenses. And what you can, because of the difference in the wavelength, you will find a mismatch in the focal points of the pump and probe beam which are on the order of some 10 microns or 100 microns, which is sufficient to obtain the, the uh, mismatch in the modes. And you can use one as a pump beam and the other as a probe beam. Uh, since we were working with the flowing systems, we needed not a commercial thermal lens microscope, which is, you can buy it from uh, a spin-off company of Professor Kitamori in, in Japan. But we have constructed our own thermal lens microscope, which gave us flexibility in changing the beam ready of the pump and probe beams. So here you, you see this is a probe beam, still with a quite bulky laser system with argon ion and the helium neon. Uh, and by tilting the mirrors, we could also displace the, the axis. Oh, we, we could offset the axis of the pump and the probe beams because we wanted to compensate for the heat loss due to the flowing sample. Because now we will not be coaxial with the flow, but we will be orthogonal or transversal to the flow, and this would have much, much stronger effects. Um, more important from the theoretical point of view was our new uh, consideration of the thermal lens effect and the thermal lens model, which is based on the fact that the thermal lens is considered usually as a, as a thin lens in, in your sample. This is not true particularly not true for the highly diverging pump beams and probe beams like in thermal lens microscopy. So we, ha we have considered our system as a series of uh, thin lenses located at different positions along the propagation of, of the probe beam. So the total thermal lens signal is actually the contribution or the sum of all the individual uh, thermal lenses here. And, uh, we have shown that this gives a better description of the positional dependence of the thermal lens signal. Uh, the previous theory has followed the, this dotted line, the blue one or the red, the red one. I will explain in a minute why the blue and why the red. But our experimental results have shown the dots which deviated quite a lot, particularly in the, in the position of the optimal thermal lens signal. I suppose you are already familiar with this bimodal curve that my colleagues have, have described for the case of mode mismatch thermal lens signal. When the sample is, which says basically the following, when the sample is positioned in the focal point of the probe beam, you get zero signal. If you move it further along the propagation of the probe beam, the signal is what we call a normal thermal lens signal, a diverging, with a maximum at a certain position. And if you move it further towards the probe beam laser or probe beam source, the signal becomes 
a focusing uh, thermal lens signal, which is, a, in, in our terms, a negative thermal lens signal. But, so, the position of the maximum differs quite a lot, and with the new theoretical model, we could get a much better description of theoretical data. But what was more important here in this work was the, that we wanted to optimize the pump beam radius to diminish the photodegradation of label analytes. And this means that you simply increase the radius of the pump beam. Uh, with this, we have also observed and we have predicted this uh, also that by optimizing the pump beam radius, you can optimize the, the sensitivity for a particular sample size or thickness, which has not been done so before. Uh, here we have an example on the right-hand side for a two micrometer excitation beam radius. And we were increasing the sample length with this very simple system we just had a, an, a wedge cuvette, handmade. So uh, by putting this displacer in between the two windows of a microscope, we could obtain different thicknesses of our sample. So just by measuring at different positions, we had different thicknesses of sample. And you can see that with this pump beam radius, we can increase our sensitivity up to about 300 micrometers sample thickness. All beyond doesn't contribute anymore to the thermal lens signal. Why? Because with the, thermal lens, uh, with the microscopic objective lens, the pump beam is so tightly focused that it diverges and the power density at 300 microns is so low that it doesn't contribute anymore to the generation of thermal lens. So, uh, <coughs> then we have thought, why don't we optimize the pump beam radius for the different thicknesses of the samples? Because sometimes you, had, you have to work with 100 microns, sometimes with 200, sometimes more. Uh, another observation in this work was that by using the di diffraction limit focusing, yeah? this is 700 micrometers radius, this is almost the diffraction limit for the used wavelength, we see that we observe a much smaller signal, you see, compared to the lower power density, the signal here is much higher, in this case it's lower. Now. We have, of course, we had to displace the sample because of the changing focal point with the radius. But in a given range, we could measure, we could, we could find a maximum of both signals because it's actually not important whether the signal is positive or negative. Yeah? In the same range of positions, we could measure the highest signal for two microns and the highest signal for the 0.7 micrometer excitation. Why this? Because you can see that for different sample thicknesses, we have a different optimal pump beam radius. So here now I'm showing the measurement points for a 100 micrometer thick sample and for a 300 micrometer thick sample, the red line. You see, of course, the longer the optical interaction, the higher signal, of course. But for a single curve, you can see that going from the diffraction limit here, by increasing the pump beam radius, you get the highest signal. And then if you increase it further, of course, the power density decreases and you, you, get, you start losing your sensitivity. For the thicker sample, of course, over almost 3.5 microns radius of the pump beam gave the highest sensitivity. 
So this shows you that for different sample thicknesses, you can optimize the sensitivity by optimizing the, the pump beam radius. And uh, usually you can calculate it from this equation. This is square root of the excitation wavelength times the thickness of your sample divided by four pi. This is how you can determine the optimal pump beam radius. And from the point of view of photodegradation of your analyte, a very important consequence, yeah, with one-tenth or even one-twentieth of the power density of the one given at the diffraction limit, we can improve the signal by almost 40% in the 100 micrometer thick sample or even 2.3 times, so 230% for the 300 micrometer sample. So very important when you want to achieve highest sensitivity in thermal lens microscopy and prevent photodegradation. Uh, in the past, everything was, and also when you buy a commercial thermal lens microscope, this one is usually diffraction limit focused and does not allow for such, such optimizations. Let's now consider the effect of velocity. We can calculate how much a certain limer, uh, flow velocity will affect your signal, which in principle follows the temperature rise in your sample. And you can see that uh, at the steady state sample, we get, of course, a maximum signal. But when we start increasing the flow velocity in this direction, the maximum, the position of the maximum temperature rise is shifted along the, along the flow. And at the same time, the maximum temperature rise decreases. So we get, in principle, less, less thermal lens signal. So the idea is shifting or displacing the axis of the pump and probe beams in the direction of the flow. And this is demonstrated here. So we have the excitation beam which produces the heat at this point, but the flow carries downstream. Therefore, we have to set or position the axis of the probe beam slightly downstream, as it's shown here. So you see here that the axis of the pump beam and the probe beam, the red one, do not coincide. And by doing this, we compensate for the, at least partly for the loss of heat, and we can obtain much better sensitivities. This is shown here, the, the red dots, and they even show some non-linearity, but the calibration curve is the, has the, the lowest slope, even if we take into consideration this linear part here. When we go to the uh, zero velocity or steady state sample, we have, of course, much higher sensitivity, which is shown with this black calibration curve. And when we displace and we place uh, the probe beam at the, what we call the optimal, at least experimentally optimal condition, we get a higher sensitivity. Um, we can also calculate the optimal um, curves for different velocities in, in microchannel, uh, for different uh, excitation beam radius. Um, and we can see that some of them, the values, uh, these are the measured values, do not correspond well to the uh, theoretical values. The reason is that uh, uh, we know only the average flow velocity from the measurement or by setting the, the velocity. But in the microchannel, we have to take into account the, that the flow velocity is distributed from the maximum 
uh, on the axis or, or in the center of the capillary to lower velocities on the walls of the capillaries. And this is what contributes to the, uh, to the differences. Uh, in terms of effects on photodegradation, we can study this by using, by comparing the results of a photolabile analyte to a stable analyte. And uh, here we, for example, here we, we have the ferroin. This is iron two complex with 110 phenantrolin, a very known um, colorimetric reagent in analytical chemistry. And we see that uh, with increasing excitation power, which will cause degradation, there is no effect on the calibration line. They are, they are linear, they are straight lines. Yeah? When we do this for chromium DPC, you see very, very strong deviation from the linearity with the increasing laser power. Yeah? But as you can see, uh, the decrease, the, the relative decrease in the, in the case of uh, higher flow rate is less than in the case of lower flow rate. This can be found by comparing the slopes of the two lines for 20 and 50 microliters per minute, which contribute, uh, which consider only the effect of the flow. The flow is taking the heat away. That's why at higher flow, the slope is lower. Uh, and in this case, of course, we have to consider only the very, very lowest excitation powers, because otherwise we cannot compare the slopes. Uh, here we have a ratio of only 1.20. It means that the, uh, the value at 50 microliter per minute is higher, which is caused by less degradation at higher flow rate. Yeah? So if the degradation, um, if there would be no degradation or the degradation would be the same in both cases, we, would, we should observe the similar ratio as here with the, with the photostable compound. But in this case, there is less degradation at 50 microliters per minute, which is normal because there is shorter uh, residence time, less degradation, so this value decreases by about, about um, 8%. Now, the last five minutes, do I have five more minutes? Organi two? Okay, everybody's hungry. Uh, just uh, to consider uh, or maybe we do it tomorrow. Huh? I, would, I would still like to spend five more minutes on this, so let's, let's do it tomorrow before I bother you with all, all the different possible applications. Uh, what I would like to show is how can we use, <clears throat> how can we use advantage of, of tunable light sources like a xenon lamp, of course with much, much lower power, but taking the advantage of some phenomena in thermal lens microscopy, which we have disregarded in the macroscopic thermal lens. This is the heat losses on the boundaries, on the front, on, on the rear mirror, because the large, of the large sample, we consider the loss of heat negligible, or the effects on the thermal lens signal negligible. In the microscopic world, we will see that the temperature change at the boundaries is still considerable and we can use it to enhance actually the thermal lens signal. But let's, let's see how do we do this tomorrow. So um, at this time, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, of course, don't be shy. Thank you very much, Professor Franco.